So um, I think I'll start. Uh, were all of you present on the first webinar, Creating Food for Thoughts, or did you have a chance to review the, the recording? Um, perhaps a better, I'll phrase that differently. Is there anybody on the webinar who hasn't had a chance to either see live or the recording of the first webinar, Creating Food for Thought? That's good. <coughs> Oh, Chris, you haven't seen, but but I think you were actually on the the webinar, were you not? Or maybe you weren't. Ah, okay. Well, I'm going to actually start off by a, a little recap of that first webinar. It's not too late, Chris. You can still watch the recording. It's up on YouTube. Um, but I'll do a bit of a recap, um, just in brief. Oh, cool, Shah, that's great. Got the link to the notes as well. Uh, so just to recap what we learned in the last webinar, it was really in, in three parts. So the first was uh, why tell stories. And I wonder if any of you who were alert and present during that webinar, can you just sort of type in some of your thoughts as to why we tell stories? Don't all type at once. Or perhaps to jog your memory, why tell stories rather than just giving people uh, a load of data and information. That's a good answer, Maud, to touch people. Yeah. Just the, the simple facts uh, don't move people emotionally and they don't move people to take action. Any else? Any other uh, thoughts on why tell stories? Well, one of the answers, okay, Charlotte says to interest them. Yeah, that's also very true. One of the, the things I said in the, the webinar was that the, the human brain is actually constructed to process information in story structure. And any story doesn't just have the, the raw data. It doesn't, doesn't just have the bare facts. It actually arranges them in a way that makes sense. So stories really are about making sense of the world, making sense of our experience, uh, and making sense of what happens. And when we do that, as Maud says, we remember things. Um, Margot, you're having some problems with, with the chat. Um, OK, I'm just going over, Margot, to, to, to recapping what we learned last time. So why tell stories? It's really about arranging the information in a way that makes sense of what happened and that makes it meaningful in a way that touches people, interests them, and encourages them to, to join in to, to take action. And when you touch people, of course, you, it, people also remember it. So good points there from all of you. And then we talked a bit about what makes a good story. Now, what can you remember from the webinar, or even if not from the webinar, what do you think makes a good story? Yeah, Chris, it's, it's emotional. Yeah, it touches people. Uh, 
Um, Margot, yeah, you're making a similar point. Not too many facts and figures, but heart-based. Yeah. And Charlotte's saying you can often engage with the main points more strongly. Yeah, these are all all good points. Um, I think a lot of what makes a good story is also to do with the way it, it's structured. Um, and this brings on to the, the next point, which is the basics of story structure. Um, <laughs> OK. Charlotte's correcting her own English, which is good. Uh, so, And then we talked about the basics of story structure. And there are three things uh, to the to basics of story structure. See if you can remember what those three things are. A beginning, a middle, and an end. Well done. Top marks to Charlotte. And there we are. I've jumped ahead. And we also talked about the, the the ingredients of what must go in a good story. And it's really these six questions. Uh, these are the basic ingredients of any story. We need to know who, what, where, when, why, and how. And really, the most important of all those questions although they're all important, but the, the thing which really makes the difference between a story and just giving the facts is the why. And uh, it's very, very important to have a very strong sense of why in the story um, to make it. That's really what, what touches the, the heart, makes it emotional. Um, it's what makes it interesting. And it's what helps, it what helps people to remember afterwards. Um, and we talked a bit about using tools like mind mapping to actually take those six questions and unpack them a bit and explore the who, the what, the where, the when, the why, and the how before you then start to write your story. So you're already starting to think about these questions, and then you can think about how you arrange the information. So I asked you uh, to do a bit of homework. and. Uh, some of you uh, did, and congratulations to those who did. Um, and in fact, the first piece of homework I got was from uh, Yiliu Williams, and that she was actually writing a report of a Greencoat forum, which happened. And so her bit of homework was called Food Waste, the Myth and the Reality. And I don't think Yiliu is actually on this webinar this time, but I've given her some feedback um, anyway by email. So she starts off her article by saying, food waste is a global issue that begins at home. A third of all food produced in the UK is thrown away, with 32% wasted on the journey from field to fork. It is a massive problem, both environmentally and for those with a social conscience, that, food is, that good food is binned when more than 4 million people are affected by food poverty in the UK. Kevin Chung from Food Cycle, Emma Walsh from WAR, WRAP, and George Gordon from Tesco shared a platform to talk about these major issues at the Greencoat Forum on the 24th of September 2014 in London. The talk was preceded with a feast prepared by Food Cycle, exemplary of a social enterprise in action. The event was hosted by IFC's TIJE, Trust and Integrity in a Global Economy, group chaired by its business director, Mike Smith. So, um, hi Suresh, welcome. Uh, good. So, I'd just be interested in your feedback on this opening to this story. Uh, how how does this read to you? Does it is it something which grabs your interest? Uh, do you think it will be interesting to other people? Yeah, Margot says the opening is very strong. 
and Maud likes the first paragraph, and Charlotte thinks the opening is good. Yeah, I agree. I think this is a very strong opening because it gives a very strong why, why the forum is important right at the start of the article. And I think a lot of people would, would have been surprised and perhaps a bit shocked by that statistic that 32% of food is thrown away on the journey from field to fork and that it's a massive problem both environmentally and for those with a good social, with a social conscience. So um, that was some of the feedback I gave uh, the ELU, that it was a really strong beginning. And actually, when you're writing an article, that's half the battle. If you get a really good beginning to your article, then you've got people hooked, like the, the fish on the end of the line. And uh, even if the rest of the article is not as strong, if you've hooked them in at the beginning with a strong, really strong why, uh, then they'll continue to read it. And uh, so I encourage you to, to think carefully about the beginnings of your articles and having a really strong why and, and try and make it relevant to, to real problems uh, either out in the world or problems that your, some of your readers might identify with. Margot is saying that she thinks the second half, the second paragraph, kind of lets you lose interest, too much facts and figures. Um, yeah, I see where you're coming from. Um, at the same time, I personally think it's OK to try and get some of that basic information uh, up front. Um, what you'll see if you read newspaper, newspaper articles also do the same kind of thing. They try and cram in all the essential facts right at the beginning of the story. And the reason for this goes back to the days when uh, the editor, part of the editor's job was literally to cut the, the story to fit the available space on the page. And they would cut from the end. So um, you might write uh, 1,200 words and uh, the the editor would see and say there's only room for about 250. And they would cut from the end. So they would just choose your first 250 words. So you had to make sure that the real basics of the story were in that first um, 250 words. And I, I still think it's a good practice to give, give the basics, basic facts and figures, those six questions, um, fairly early on in the story. So that if people ha are pushed for time, uh, that they can get a sense of the story uh, and what it is early on and then read on for more unpacking of the, the details, um, perhaps some quotes from, from participants, uh, quotes from the main speakers. And in fact, that is what uh, Yeely Williams did in this story. Uh, after that, this beginning, she then reported a bit more on what each of the speakers had, had said and some of the discussion after that. I'm not going to share with you the, the whole story, um, but it was a good story. But we'll go just to, to the end. Um, and this is how she ended the story. Um, as with IFC's key value that change begins with self, when it's, when it's about food, change also begins at home. In an ideal world, waste not, want not would hold true. The acute challenge to reduce the 7.2 uh, MT, I'm not quite sure what MT is, meters squared, cubic meters perhaps, or metric tons, of generated food waste must be a shared responsibility. We all need to take action to do our bit to make a difference, to benefit both financially and environmentally, and to ensure that food waste becomes a fact of the past. So apart from the not being clear about what the MT is in the 7.2 MT, what do you think uh, of this as an ending to a story? What's your impressions? So Charlotte says she would have liked to know how to do that. Um, that's a good point. I think some of that did come into the article itself, the main part. Um, Margot says it brings it back to the reader. Very true. And this is very important uh, for our articles, because you want to end 
really with what's traditionally called a call to action. So in other words, at the end of your story, um, you need to give the reader a sense of what you want them to do or to take away or to think uh, as a result of reading that, the article. And Maud says she invites us to do something, and that, that's true, and that's the call to action. Um, Margot is saying she's sorry, but my former replies seem to pop up every time. It's not happening to, I, I'm not seeing it here, Margot, so it may just be on your end. Um, so anyway, just, just carry on. Uh, yeah, I really liked this, this ending because it, it brought in uh, IFC's key values, so it kind of made it relevant to initiatives of change and initiatives of change readership. Uh, and then it had this strong call to action that it, we can all do our bit, as she says. And, and then it's a shared responsibility. So I think uh, Yilu did a really good uh, example of how to write a, a report in a way which has a, a strong beginning, a good uh, call to action at the end, and the middle part was really kind of reporting on the end, on the event, some of the things that people had said, um, a bit of unpacking of the actual contents of the the Green Coat Forum. So uh, yeah, that was a really good example of, of how to to write a story. Let's move on to. Something else, uh, Maud, well done. You managed to, to get something in. Um, is, now, Maud, just to, out of interest, is this a, a true story is, or is this something from your imagination? I, I gave you freedom to use either a real story or, or to make something up. So I'm just curious to know which it is. True story, great. So you know these people. So Maud's beginning was, uh, yeah, Claire and Hughes got married last week. As a honeymoon, they planned to spend six months in Madagascar, sent there by the French NGO Marc Madagascar. Despite the bad web connection in Madagascar, they will try to tell their story. Here are their first impressions. And then their first paragraph is, we are now living in the country of Boababs and Lemures. The economic situation is catastrophic. Most of the firms don't start to work again after the big crisis in June. We are the first tourists in months. On the southwest coast where we went to spend our first week, the town of Tuliar is more a slum than a real village. So um, I hope you don't mind, Lord, but, uh, Maud, but we're going to um, open it up for feedback from the rest of the, the group. So uh, from the rest of you, what are your impressions of this uh, opening of this story? So Charlotte says that she'd like a short description of the place to get the feel of it. Yeah. Suresh says, wasn't the NGO aware of the, ground, the reality on the ground when they sent the couple off on the honeymoon? Um, yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, it's a question the reader might have, which is not answered in the story. but. That's OK. We don't have to answer every question of the reader. And Chris says, all the facts are right there at the beginning, and it's helpful. Yeah, that's good feedback. Uh, I really like the, the opening sentence, uh, Claire and Hughes got married last week, because although it's not your strong why, it, it is actually a, a, a good emotional connection with the reader, because weddings are, are things which everybody can identify with. Uh, we all love weddings. Um, so the, the, it immediately creates a rapport with the reader that this is about uh, wedding, honeymoon. Um, so although it's made it maybe quite a different kind of story to the one we looked at just now by Yili Williams, there's still, I think, it's a strong beginning because of that, uh, that rapport you create, and this is something which everybody loves to hear about weddings. 
and then they they uh, they talk about uh, their experiences. We're now living in the country of Boababs and Lemures, and that brings in a. It starts to paint a picture, and and even if it's not a very complete picture, already the reader in their mind will be uh, seeing those those trees and those animals. Uh, so that's also very good. Um, and then they talk about the economic situation. This is where it starts to go a bit more from the, the personal uh, to the geopolitical and the hinting at some of the, the, the big picture problems in the world, which also were hinted at by the fact that they were sent by a French NGO. So it's a different kind of beginning, but I think it's also a, a strong beginning to a story. Um, if, if, there any, if there was anything you would do to improve this beginning, what would it be? Any suggestions? So Sura says there is an indication that the couple may have asked for Madagascar. Yeah, that's that's true. There's kind of ambiguity there. Charlotte says perhaps hint to the why, why we are reading the story. Maud says tell more about the NGO work. Yeah, that, that was my feeling as well. Um, and I think saying a bit more about the work of the NGO, what Mark Madagascar does, would also give a bit more of a stronger sense of why, why this story is significant. Um, so if I was going to improve this, I would probably want to bring in something of the purpose for their working with this NGO. Uh, although they're there on their honeymoon, uh, why did they choose uh, to do this when they could have been sunning themselves on a beach in the south of France or the Caribbean? Um, but still, yeah, thank you, Maud. Well done for, for doing that. And Maud says, yes, we're reading the story to know more about the NGO. That's true. Um, but let's move on to the, the next page. Uh, so it's a short story, so we've actually got the whole of it here. Uh, so the story continues. We were welcomed by the nun Jean at the airport. Uh, what makes easier our passage through the customs? Uh, the nuns are adorable and shy. For the moment, we have a special food treatment, not yet rice three times a day. None of them speak French, and that's why we are here. The nuns organize a busy schedule. Each week, we have to organize a French and computer training in seven different cities. It's going to make us travel. In Tananarive, half of my pronunciation, I'm not familiar with these names. In Tanarive, uh, the capital, a room is reserved for us with a bathroom and a small one-person bed. The land is beautiful but so poor. For the moment, we had to follow the RN7 running from Tana to Tuliar. I'm guessing the RN7 is a road. From valley and rice field, we have to pass to the bush. Between these two parts is the majestic plateau of Horombe. We discovered a lot of endemic plants and animals, like the, and I won't try and pronounce these uh, names of species. By the way, it's our Vola Tantili. We'll let you guess what it means. Well, I, I'm afraid I can't guess what that means. Um, and my, part of this may be uh, the difficulty of translating uh, French into English. And so doubly thank you, Maud, for not only doing your homework, but actually writing it in not your first language. Um, so a few more of the comments. Chris is saying, I think the intrigue is in the surprise on the ground. Maybe move that into paragraph one. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, point, and that could have made, made a stronger beginning. Uh, Suresh says, so it's possible it may not have been just a honeymoon. 
there could be a couple working something aligned to their interests. That's true, yeah. And more comments, it's not very logical the way the story is telling. Yeah, that's that's true. And I'm guessing it, it kind of reads like uh, a letter that you would send to your friends um, rather than a story. And maybe that's what it was. Maybe it was a letter sent to friends. When you're writing a letter, it's often what we call stream of consciousness. So you don't kind of sit down and plan how you're going to structure the letter first. You just write things as they pop into your mind. Um, and that's kind of OK in this case, because you framed it that this is them telling their story. Uh, so maybe the reader would not necessarily be expecting something so polished uh, as a story. But if you were to organize it differently, then I think some of the things we've talked about uh, in reorganizing it so that the, perhaps the, the work and the relevance of the NGO comes in uh, earlier on. Margot raises the point, she doesn't really get what the message is. And that's a valid point. Um, as I say, if, it's, if this is kind of like a, a letter to friends, then it doesn't necessarily have to have a message. But if it's something which you want to uh, promotes on your NGO's website, then you would probably need to think a bit more carefully about what the message is. Uh, and have some kind of call to action at the end, some kind of what you want the, the reader to do. Uh, even something like uh, you can support the work of this NGO by going to their website. So uh, thank you, Maud. We'll, we'll move on. I hope that was a bit helpful. And we'll look at one more piece of homework. Um, and this was sent by Ulrike, who I, I think is away uh, this week, so she's not on the call. Um, but she wrote uh, a story um, of a meeting, an IFC meeting in, in Germany. Uh, the headline was uh, Bergtreffen again, forgive my pronunciation, a meeting between Castle and Berlin in the old Knight's Castle. Uh, and she says, at the beginning of October, a group between 10 and 55 years old spent a unique and beneficial weekend together on the theme, Experience Community, Discover Friends, which replenished inwardly. A young French woman explained it like this, a bouffe d'oxygène, like a deep breath. The conversations and discussions around the table and in groups was accompanied by fun, games, music, ample laughter, and a lot of creativities. By this use of diverse design during the morning and afternoon sessions, all the different age groups have been at all times naturally integrated and made responsible. So uh, I'll give you a few minutes to digest that, but I'm interested also in your, your feedback on the opening of this story. Uh, Maud says it's factual. Yes, it is. So it gives you the when in October. Um, it gives you the where in the title between Castle and Berlin. It gives you the who, to some extent, the who, a group of between 10 and 55 years old. Yeah, uh, Chris, you're saying you're not really sure why I could, why I should care. Yeah, that was my feeling as well. There wasn't a strong why in this which would connect to the ordinary reader. Uh, Charlotte says she'd like it to be a bit more punchy at the beginning, a more punchy line to grip you. Maybe an idea of the problem that they're trying to overcome. That's very, very true, uh, Charlotte. And Maud makes the comment, it's kind of, it reads like it's for internal communication. Yeah, and I think that's, that's true. Uh, because it's, there's an assumption there that it's going to be interesting but without explaining why it, it's interesting and why it's relevant. And I think often when we're reporting on, on IFC events and we think we're writing to an IFC audience, 
we maybe assume that just because it's an IFC event that our readership will be interesting, uh, interested in what we're writing. And I think we need to try and break beyond that and think um, how is this relevant to something to, to somebody who has no interest in IFC as such, but how does it connect to, to real problems in the world? Um, and that was some of the feedback I, I gave. Um, so and I'll just move on to a bit further in the story. Suresh is saying, called serendipity. What do you mean by called serendipity? Oh, sorry, um, Suresh. Think and unique sounds strong enough. Uh, okay, I'll just slip back. Yes, yeah, she she says um, just to go back to the beginning again. She talks about it as being they spent a unique and beneficial weekend. Um, and this was again something I fed back to Ulrika that without actually saying why it was unique or why it was beneficial, those words really don't carry a lot of weight right at the beginning of a story. Uh, it's unique and beneficial are kind of, that's our evaluation uh, having experienced the thing. Uh, but really, you need to, to allow, to, to let this, the, the event show why it's unique and why it's beneficial before you can then make that uh, assessment. So that's more something to say, perhaps say at the end of the, the article. That's in the form of feedback from participants. You could have one of them saying it was a, a unique and beneficial weekend. So let's move on a bit further into the article. This was a bit further down the text uh, where she, she has this paragraph. The following text gave material to inspire a time of personal reflection to think about our house of life, Liebenhaus, which we shared afterwards. And the quote was, who are in touch with the lifetime dreams will expand something which can change the world. Only those who still have dreams can move something in this world. We are more than this part of body which is surrounded by flesh. In us live dreams which expand our own heart and which can bring this world into movement. And that's a quote from Anselm Gruden. And when I read the story, this, this quote leapt out to me a bit, and I suggested to, to Ulrika that maybe she could uh, shift something of this near the beginning of the story. Because I got a sense that this was kind of closer to the heart of what that weekend was about. It was a group of people of different generations reflecting on, on these questions. And I think any one of us uh, can identify with, with these questions, with this, this quote. And uh, we can see why it would, would be beneficial and perhaps a, a kind of a unique and beneficial experience uh, to reflect on these questions in an intergenerational group. Uh, so that was some of the feedback. And I think when we write our stories, if it's not all the, the stories we're going to write will be uh, about an event which has particular sort of problems in the world significance, like the, the first example where it was talking about food waste. And because some of the IFC events are more inward, they're more reflective events. And I think then you really need to try and tease out, try and uh, search for the gold. What was the real core of, of that reflective time? And express it in a way that can connect with anybody. Uh, because we all have these issues in our lives where we, we want to reflect. And make, maybe make that the thing which you open with. Um, yeah, hi Parag Shah, welcome. Uh, so thank you very much, all of you who, who did uh, homework. And if you didn't have a chance yet to, to write something, then I would still encourage you to have a go at writing and send it to me, and I'll give you some, some feedback on it. Um, because I think that's often the best way to learn is to actually do things. Um, 
so that's kind of by way of practicing really what we talked about in the first webinar, which is about how to think about your story in terms of a beginning, a middle, and an end, and focusing on that strong beginning and the call to action at, at the end. I just want to move on to perhaps some more advanced stuff on actually how you write. And, and this is really about, in your writing, how to speed things up. I don't know whether you've had the experience that some things you read, and you read them very quickly. Uh, it's like I've read, sometimes I've picked up uh, a novel, and I, if it's a novel that I can't put down, I remember the last Harry Potter novel, I read the whole thing, and it was quite a thick book, on the flights from uh, Melbourne to, to Geneva. It was so gripping, I literally could not put it down. Um, and part of that is in the style of writing. A lot, a lot of that also is in the actual story itself. Uh, but the actual style of writing can help speed things up or slow things down. And one of the things I find which speed things up for the reader is to use active verbs rather than passive. And some examples of that, um, the, the active form would be the pa participants learned how to. And the passive form would be the participants were taught how to. I don't know whether you can see uh, the difference. Uh, in that. In the active form, uh, you have the subject, which in this case is the participants, the verb, which is they learned, the verb is to learn, and then the object, what they learned. So another example of the active would be Frank Bookman understood human nature. Um, but what we often do, and, and I, I don't know why this is, but often when we're writing reports, we kind of have this image in our heads that it's got to be this kind of very stuffy and um, formal English, which often then takes us into the passive construction, which is reversed. That's object, verb, subject. So to turn that one on its head, the passive form would be human nature was understood by Frank Bookman. And this is, you can imagine uh, somebody writing a very formal thing, or they might say, human nature was understood by Frank Bookman very well. Um, so I want to encourage you to think a bit uh, in your writing to, to have this very simple structure. It's kind of like how people talk. People don't say in conversation, human nature was understood by Frank Bookman very well, or the participants were taught how to uh, read and write. We tend to talk naturally in the active form. Um, I went shopping today and bought some bananas, rather than um, bananas were bought at the supermarket. Is this making sense? Uh, so Chris is making yes. This is key. Eliminate was and is where possible. Yeah, good. I'm glad it's making sense to you. And I think it's partly a mindset thing. For some reason, for some people, when we think we're writing something which is going to be published, we immediately jump into this sort of formal, uh, passive voice. And instead, I'd just like to encourage you to relax a bit and think of how you'd tell the story if you were telling it to your best friend. Uh, yeah. And this is linked to all of that kind of stuff, which is, um, when we're in the passive, we sometimes use nouns instead of verbs. And the typical examples of, of this would be, so there was a discussion about, there was a discussion about, um, I don't know, uh, why it's important to clean our teeth in the mornings. Instead of saying in the active voice, the team discussed. So here the verb is discuss, to discuss. And when we go into that formal passive thing, we often turn the verb discussed into a noun, that there was a discussion. And some other examples of the kind of thing we do in our writing, which slow things down, is we talk about uh, 
a decision was made, a meeting was had, there was a conversation, uh, uh, they had a quiet time. Um, Joe Bloggs gave a speech, uh, Mohan gave a presentation. Um, the conclusion was blah de blah. Um, uh, the participants expressed gratitude and they expressed satisfaction. Uh, let's take these one at a time uh, and see if you can turn them from the, the passive uh, noun form into an active form. So uh, first one, instead of saying uh, a decision was made, what could you say uh, in an active way? Uh, Sir says decided. No, that's that's not it. They decided. Yeah, that's right. They decided. So instead of a decision was made, we say they decided. Uh, the next example, uh, this word meeting. So instead of saying on the 5th of October, uh, there was a meeting to discuss, uh, how would we put that in the active form? Yep, yeah, that's right, Suresh. They met to discuss. Uh, Maud says, discussion on the 15th of... I think, Suresh, you've got it. Yeah. So they met um, to discuss because the verb is, is meet. Um, the next one, conversation. Uh, Frank Bookman and Peter Howard uh, had a conversation about quiet times. How would you put that into the active vo uh, voice? <laughs> Suresh says they conversed on umpteen issues. Yes, I'm sure they did. That's right, you got it. So they conversed or they discussed or they talked about. All of these things are active forms rather than having a conversation. Um, here's a, an interesting one. This is one we use all the time in IOC, a quiet time. Is there a way we can put uh, a group had a quiet time into an active form? This was a, this is a bit more tricky, so, but have a go at it anyway. So instead of the, the, the group had a quiet time, how might you put that in an active form? Uh, Parag, you, you, you were saying it's the same thing, they had a quiet time. Charlotte, that's a good, good uh, go at it. Taking a time of quiet in the group, yeah. Please be quiet for a quiet time. Chris saying they took time in silence. Yeah, I think that's all good. Yeah. And this, I think it will actually make a big difference in our writing if we try and avoid uh, using quiet time as a noun because it becomes a bit jargony when we, we do that. Um, and try and think each case how we can put this into an active uh, an active form, and you've got some good examples. They quieted themselves. That's another good one, Chris. Um, next one, speech. Uh, Joe Bloggs gave a speech about industry. How would you put that into the active form? So Russ says, his energetic speaking had a spell down. I like that. Uh, speaking about industry, Charlotte says, speaking about industry, speaking about industry, Joe Blog said, etc. Yes, that would be good. Or even just 
very simple uh, Joe Blog spoke about industry. Joe Blog spoke. Yeah, good. Uh, the next example presentation. Uh, Edward Peters gave a presentation uh, about initiatives of change. How could you put that in the active form? Edward Peters presents, presents, yeah. He presented the initiatives of change, yeah. That's, that's good, yeah. And Suresh said, presenting us his opening address was a lesson in brevity for the listener. <laughs> I love it, yeah, good. Um, Conclusion. So the conclusion of the meeting was, let's try putting that into an active form. They concluded, or he concluded, yeah. The meeting concluded with, yeah, that's good. I think you've got you're getting the hang of it. Uh, another example: gratitude. Uh, the participants expressed gratitude for everything they had learned. How would you put that in the active form? Chance expressing gratitude to the students. It's still there as a noun, um, Charlotte. You've not turned gratitude from a noun into a verb. They express gratitude. I'm catching you out with this one. What is the verb of um, they gave thanks? Chris, you got it. You've nailed it. Yeah. Um, actually, no, you haven't because uh, you're still, thanks is you've turned, you've just swapped one uh, noun for another. They thanked, that's it. So uh, that makes it more, can you, can you feel the difference between they thanked and they gave thanks? The participants thanked, yeah. Um, yeah, so watch yourself with this one. It, it's not always easy, but, but uh, yeah, keep practicing with, with this kind of thing. And, and the last one, um, satisfaction. Okay, so uh, there was a general feeling of satisfaction. How might you put that in an active way? Yep, they were happy. Satisfying his appetite was a challenge for those. <laughs> oh, Suresh, you, you should go into comedy. This is very good. Yep, the meeting satisfied. Um, all the People were satisfied. I think that's probably the simplest and, and best solution here, Maud. Uh, it's a bit tricky, actually, satisfaction. Um, but I think, yeah, to say people were satisfied, that, that really is, puts it into a more active form. So we kind of we've gone a bit over our time, uh, but thank you very much for for your participation. Um, was this helpful? What else have I got? Oh yeah, sorry, one more one more slide. 
uh, which is also about avoiding, uh, about keeping things fast, is, which is avoiding any jargon or insider talk. Because anything which uh, is like that will slow things down for the, the reader who is not familiar with initiatives of change. So these are some of the, the IFC insider uh, jargon, which we should really try and avoid. And explain each time as if we're explaining them to somebody who knows nothing of initiatives of change. So quiet time, the four standards, four absolutes, guidance, uh, these places which we all know what, what, what they are and what they represent, but other people just don't necessarily know that. We sometimes talk about change in a kind of way that we know what it means, but, but we don't necessarily explain what it means to somebody else. And of course, all of these dreadful uh, sets of letters, these acronyms, which we love so much in initiatives of change, like MRA, IFC, TIGE, F4F, COP, ILLP, uh, CA, common actions. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, av avoiding this will also help your, your articles be more communicative to a, a non-IFC audience. And I'll leave you with this, this quote uh, from uh, On Writing Well by William Zinser, which is called, um, which is about really stripping down the essentials, trying to look for every word that doesn't need to be there. And he says, the secret to good writing is to strip every sentence to its cleanest components. Every word that serves no function, every long word that could be a short word, every adverb that carries the same meaning that's already in the verb, every passive construction that leaves the reader unsure of who is doing what, these are the thousand and one adulterants that weaken the strength of a sentence. And they usually occur in proportion to the education and the rank, <laughs> which is a funny thing. He's basically saying that, you know, that the more important or well-educated somebody is, uh, the more fat they have in their speaking. So politicians might be the best example of that. Um, so really what this is saying is try and keep things very simple. Explain things very simple as you would do to a small child. And if you can do that, then you're really making it very easy for other people to read and they will be more likely to continue to the end of your article. So uh, any questions or any, any feedback or any observations? Uh, Maud said, it helps me to write interesting and clear teasers on the website. Yeah, that's true. And the teasers are so important. In French. Yes. Chris says, small things make a big difference. That's very true. So Chris says, sum up passive tense and trim the fat. Yep. And Parag saying, thank you, Mike. I'm really happy to have you as my trainer as I am really weak at this. Yeah, that's right. It really comes down to practice. Um, and relax, write the way you might talk to, to somebody and then simplify it because sometimes when we talk we use more words than we need to when we're writing. Um, but really the most important thing is if you think about the beginnings of your articles and having a really strong why and a strong connection uh, because really this, you've got to try and sell your story in the first uh, first few sentences. You've got to give your reader a really strong reason to continue with you. Um, and all of this other stuff about using active uh, voice, uh, trimming the, the fat, that will help. But if you don't have a strong why in the first place, then uh, the, the reader still won't continue. So thank you. I hope this was helpful. Um, would you like to have more training webinars on more perhaps more of the kind of the, the technical stuff of writing.
Um, or do you feel at this stage you must basically need to go away and practice? So <laughs> very clear and strong yes from Suresh. OK. Yeah. Chris likes this kind of workshop stuff. Good. Uh, do we have homework this time? Well, I would suggest, again, the best homework you can do is to write a story. And if you write something, and we can then look at it in the next webinar, and perhaps in the process of um, sort of teasing apart what makes the story work, what's not so good, what can be improved, I think that may be the best way to, to learn. So Walter says, can we have something specific on how to write online? Um, what do you mean about writing online? What do you mean as opposed to writing for um, for a newsletter? I mean for a website. I don't think there's a difference between writing online and writing for a website. Uh, sorry, writing for a, a publication. That, that would be my perspective. Uh, I think good writing to a general audience is, is the same, whether it's online or whether it's in a in print. Now, you might have a, other people might have a different perspective on that, but that's my perspective. Um, I guess one thing is perhaps to say about online is that it's even more important than in print to, to grab your readers uh, because there is something else more interesting just to click away. So that is the, the challenge really for writing online is it's you know one click of the mouse and you've lost your, your reader. Um, Suresh is asking how many words. I, as a rule of thumb, between 500 and 800, but it could be shorter, um, could be longer if it's a really strong uh, article and there's a lot of rich content which you can't, which would be um, a shame to, to lose. But in general, try not to go above 800 words. Bragg's asking, can we choose a topic for the next seminar, like writing for a newsletter or a magazine? or social networking or a report. Um, I'm going to say, imagine you're writing something for, for the website, uh, for either IFC India or the global websites, whatever it is. Um, because if it's strong enough to, to work on the website, it'll also work in printed reports. So is, is that clear? Any, any more questions to clarify what the homework is? No? OK. Well, thank you all for your participation. Thanks for sticking with it. Thank you for those who were brave enough to submit their, their work and uh, encourage you all to, to write something and uh, we'll aim to do another webinar probably in about a month's time, uh, and then, yeah, we'll, we'll, and I'll bring in some more specific training, perhaps on writing styles in that one as well, as well as doing the the feedback on what you've written. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm going to say good night. It's 11 o'clock p.m. here, and uh, see you all next time. All the best. Bye bye.